system. What it does is that it removes the alpha and beta um, cells from the product. So you have taken alpha beta cells out. Um, the gamma and delta cells, CD34 cells, NK cells are the ones which which go into the product finally and give to the patient. So you have, you have, what you have done is that what I have achieved with this is that you have achieved um, uh, to, a, to an extent, graft versus host disease prophylaxis by removing these alpha beta cells, which median graft versus host disease. But at the same time, you have, you have retained NK cells and the alpha, uh, gamma delta cells, which are going to promote engraftment and also give rise to better immune recovery post transplant. Now, what are the considerations post transplant? For immunodeficiency patients now, post transplant, what are the considerations? Infections is still a concern because if they if they are infected pre transplant or um, they had some viral reactivations that can continue post-transplant as well and can really make our life difficult for many months or sometimes years post-transplant. Toxicity, I, I mentioned earlier, you know, some of these conditions may have some peculiar toxicities which, are, which, may, which, may, which may affect post-transplant uh, period as well. For example, patients with osteopetrosis, they, we know that they have got heights of venoclosal disease to the tune of 30 to 40 percent. They have got heights of pulmonary artery hypertension. So these are the things we need to know. Graphos host is higher risk, again, because they're they, they, they have a cytokine um, activation even before transplant. They're infected, their gut may not be intact, so they will have high, heights of graft source with Immune recovery can be really slow. You know, sometimes the patients with uh, um, may need IVIG replacement for years together, one year, two years. You need to keep continuing IVIG till they have the B, B cell engraftment happens. And rejection, although they're immuno, immunodeficient patients, but as I said, it's a mixed bag. You know, um, patients with chronic granulomatous disease, leukocytation defect, they have higher rejection rates even as compared to the normal individuals as well. And more than malignancies, they will have they will have rejection rates. So this is something which we need to sometimes really, I, we, we not able to pro offer anything or even if we offer them, they're too sick to, to survive the, the transplant process. Um, I think that's my last slide and uh, I thank you for your attention and for getting any questions that you have. Thank you. It's a wonderful, lucid, uh, consolidative information and it's a uh, lot of information for the PGs who has come here to accommodate at this one session. Anyway, the session is open up for discussion. No question. I think it was either <laughs> too, too lucid or it was too muddy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank the you. First case. Sorry. Regarding the first ah, case, yeah. the comma interferon, the receptor defective. Yeah. Uh, those interferons, receptors are also produced in the same cells which are active in the production. Like, is it only the hematopoietic stem cells are involved in the other cells are also involved in the receptor no, production? No, it's only the hematopoietic stem cells. Yes, the uh, you know, interferon gamma, um, uh, which, is, which is important for it's protecting like viral cell infections cell. And, 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 and tubercular infections. Um, they, uh, important side of being for that. So in this uh, immune deficiency research, do you do uh, IVIG on regular intervals for some IVIG. Yeah. So IVIG is uh, required for, uh, that's why I was showing, I, I was quite fast, I think, you know, one, the, there's group of disorders, is B cell immunodeficiencies, right? So there only the B cells are defective, or the rest of the uh, rest of the immune system is quite normal. And what B cells do, they manufacture IVIG. So, B cell de deficiencies, you can simply give them IVIG replacement lifelong. They may not even require transplant, right? I mean, of course, there's, you know, sometimes if the IVIG therapy is not available or it's too expensive or the family is not sustaining that, then you can transplant them as well. But IVIG replacement is the safest uh, um, and the most kind of efficient method to manage them throughout the life. So those are the patients where IVIG therapy would be required for the, for the treatment and the management point of view. But what I was also mentioning is that post-transplant, the post-transplant immune reconstitution, once you've transplanted someone and then you have post-transplant immune reconstitution, I Dr. Vikram was saying that CD, CD4 cells may take two years to come back to normal levels. Similarly, after transplantation, the, the recovery of B cells and other cells as well, if the recovery of B cells is, is slow, is not, is not enough to have enough IVIG production in the body, so you need to give them IVIG till they are able to sustain IVG production themselves. And sometimes it can take one to two years to get to the level of having sustained adequate IVIG manufacturing in the, your own system. In my case of depletion, what so the percentage of loss of stem cells, practically we do any pre and post? Uh, the one I showed here, T-cell yeah, alpha beta? Yeah. So, uh, see, the, uh, the stem cell loss in the miltainy system is not much. It's a tune of 5 to 10%. 
um, um, uh, it has never been a challenge. So, and most of, fortunately, most of the times they're like small babies, and we also rely on what's called as mega dose uh, CD34. So we try to give more than 10 million per kg. Sometimes, you know, even to the tune of 20, 25 million per kg CD34s. They just uh, um, have a quick engraftment and swarm the, you know, the uh, the homing process. And for the proplexes, what do you use in the Okay, so antifungal prophylaxis, uh, again, I think uh, um, the, it depends on what is the status pre-transplant as well. And some of them, some of the chronic lung disease fellows are already either had a, either had a fungal infection prior or are still having infection on board. There's, we, we always take an utmost, I would say, um, um, precautions to not transplant them with an active fungal infection on board. But if, uh, if you know, they have had fungal infection in the past also, you still need to keep them on fungal prophylaxis throughout conditioning and post-conditioning as well. Throughout conditioning, we still choose amphotericin over azoles because it will interfere with your, um, uh, interfere with your uh, uh, farm mechanics of the, of the conditioning agents. And after, after, after the conditioning has been, after the transplant is done, either you give a, so there can be ch choice of amphotericin or echinokinin or azole as well if you are able to manage the, if they are able to take enterally or if they if are able to you know, uh, manage the um, interactions for a particular period of time. Um, so not all will may, may require a mold, this, these are mold active uh, antifungal prophylaxis. Fluconazole of course is standard of care for everyone, but mold active antifungal prophylaxis either you give for secondary prevention which has happened, some in fact happened before and now you are transplanting them or uh, they are, there is some suspicion or a possible of function on board, so you kind of cover them throughout their transplant conditioning and post-transplant with them. So these are mold, mold anti-mold covers, so you, some of the good proportion of patients would need that um, during and post-transplant. Thank you very much Thank for you. that. The last talk in this session is on a plastic anemia and congenital bone marrow failure syndromes and I invite Dr. Revati. I think there's nobody in this room who does not know Dr. Revati. She's a pediatric hematologist at uh, Apollo Specialty Cancer Center and takes a, has a great passion for uh, transplanting uh, children with various disorders and I'll hand it over to Revati. Okay, while he's uh, loading the presentation, I'll just say thank you so much to Kishore and Biju for uh, putting uh, together this program on a Sunday. We have so many people here. And if you hear my voice shaking and quivering, it's because the AC is right on our face here. I don't know how, yeah. So it's not because I'm nervous. So um, the um, thing is that there's only 25 minutes to lunch. And within 20 minutes, we're supposed to tell all the knowledge we've gained about aplastic anemia, simplify it, and tell it to all of you. And I can really see a lot of regimen-related toxicity in a lot of people. They're nodding off and feeling very tired. So I just want, out of the juniors, how many at this point feel that they will take up transplant long term? No? Oh, OK. <laughs> There's my aggressive bunch here, other than that. <laughs> OK. So uh, at the more you do transplants, you will realize that there's a lot more to learn. So what we know today can be completely different five years later, 10 years later. Four years ago, when I met Biju about a patient for haplo, I would have sworn that I'd never do a haplo in my life. And then now, this year, in all the transplant meetings, there's no mention of cord, there's only haplo. So things evolve, things change. So what you're taking today, that should be the message, that if you're ready to do transplants as a career, you have to keep abreast of what's going on in the world, you have to keep updated, and you can't be 10 years behind. This is just not possible with transplants. So already one minute of my time is over with this. So um, I just wanted to give you an introduction to aplastic anemia in children, how it's different in adults, because we're always dealing with those that can be born with aplastic anemia. A little bit on acquired aplastic anemia, what are the principles of management, especially transplant management, and the inherited marrow failure syndrome. So just these three components. 
So you know that the hematopoietic stem cells are going to give rise to your red cells, platelets and white cells. So an inherited marrow failure syndrome can affect the hematopoietic stem cell or it can only affect red cell production, platelet production or white cell production. And each of these groups come under inherited marrow failure syndromes. And each of these syndromes have given us a lot of insight into actual hematopoiesis, what is normal? Because when we see what is pathology, it gives us an insight into what is normal. For example, we never knew how important thrombopoietin is for feeding stem cells. So now so much information has come about thrombopoietin, how it not just stimulates platelet production, but also stimulates our stem cells. So there's a lot going on about which we don't know. So if we see a child with pancytopenia, we have to say, is this aplastic anemia or is it some sort of myelodysplasia, which we call refractory uh, childhood cytopenia, RCC, or is it some, and if it's aplastic anemia, is it something they are born with or is it acquired? So is it aplastic anemia? Is it inherited? Is it refractory cytopenia of childhood? So this is the main uh, uh, decision you have to take because all that you do for the patient is going to be dependent on this one uh, um, uh, information that you will gather when you're uh, uh, seeing the child. So uh, in all of these, can uh, overlap with each other. So it's not like a 19 year old can't present with Fanconi anemia. So, and it doesn't mean that a one and a half year old child, it has to be only inherited. So this is the main challenge with aplastic anemia. So you know that in acquired aplastic anemia is a disorder of the immune dysregulation. So it, it, it results because of immune dysregulation. So there are cells, T lymphocytes, the regulator T lymphocytes, which are only supposed to see all of the um, um, foreign protein as being foreign and attack them. But if there is uh, no self-tolerance and our own stem cells are being attacked, then you it results in aplastic anemia. This is a very simplified version about which people have done a lifetime of work. So um, why do we need to know this information? Because it's important with our treatment planning. If it's an immune dysregulation problem, we have a choice. We can either treat them with immunosuppression or we can replace their hematopoietic stem cell pool. So this is important to know what caused this condition. So if you see a child, you know for sure they have marrow failure. You would say uh, it can be acquired or uh, inherited, but you have to look for subtle dysmorphism. Were they family deaths, infant deaths in the family, childhood? So um, really have a look at the history and drug history. Hepatitis A is a big problem in our country and aplastic anemia because of that. PNH and autoimmunity not so common in children. With the marrow failure syndromes, you can have diamond black fun or CVE. So diamond black fun is one condition which affects red cells, white cells, Cosman syndrome, platelet star, which gets better. So you don't worry too much about thrombocytopenia, absent radii, because they are not somebody who would transplant in the newborn period. They're going to get better by their first birthday. Whereas the uh, proper inherited marrow failure syndrome, the three main ones are Fanconi, Dyskeratosis congenita, and uh, Schwarman Diamond. So these are the three we really need to know about. So we would do a count, we look for macrocytosis, we definitely need a retic count to see if they are mounting a retic response and the absolute retic count will tell you whether they are severe, very severe, what are you going to do with them. We need a bone marrow biopsy, there's no doubt about it on aspiration, we can't diagnose and we need cytogenetics to see if there's a dysplastic clone, especially monosome 7 We need liver function tests to see what their liver is like, whether it's post-viral hepatitis and PNH screen. And in stress erythropoiesis, when in the inherited marrow failure syndrome, fetal hemoglobin slightly elevated. So macrocytic anemia with elevated F is a sign of stress erythropoiesis. In all aplastic anemia in children, we would do a mitomycin C uh, or a, a DEB, which is called stress cytogenetics. It makes a huge difference. If you have Fanconi, then you're not going to offer immunosuppressive therapy. If you're transplanting them, how you prepare them for transplant is completely different to how you would do a normal aplastic anemia. So this is the most inf important information that we need before taking up a child for transplant. Without stress cytogenetics, we wouldn't pr proceed. As soon as we see a new aplastic anemia, we have to get the HLA workup done because if there is a matched sibling donor, that is the best way forward. So 
apart from all of the other basic tests, you need a Fanconi screen and you need the HLA as fast as you can when you see a child with bone with the pancytopenia. This is a normal marrow, and you can see in severe aplastic anemia how empty the marrow looks, and you look for subtle signs of um, uh, um, MDS. So we've defined the aplastic anemia, and we look at a boy like this, who's a 16-year-old who had viral hepatitis and then now come to you with a white count of 700. What are you going to do? Because these are real-life situations. Aplastic anemia is a medical emergency. So are we going to offer this boy immunosuppression or are we going to transplant him? So this is the first question. So let's live in a world where nobody has financial constraints and you're only making medical decisions. So what is the best thing to do? Immunosuppressive therapy means we have to give them uh, 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 horse ATG along with cyclosporin plus or minus um, L thrombopack. So we're going to do this or are we going to offer transplant? So you can see that there's a lot of work done nowadays to say that transplant, there's no doubt, is the first better option. So you would say that over 90% of children would do well with a transplant if they have a match sibling donor. Immunosuppressive therapy, initially they may respond, but a lot of them have problems later. So long-term follow-up, there are issues. So that would be only your second choice. So um, there's a lot.